temptation takes over my mind. Convert. Greetings from Castle Goring, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. Well, 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 Aurora is being particularly affectionate this afternoon. Yes, honey, mommy loves you too. Yes, yes, yes. So, if Aurora will allow me, I will plunge right in with 7386, who asks, Lady C, something puzzles me in the Gwyneth Paltrow case. How can Dr. Terry Saunderson have slammed into her with his skis, as she claims, when she got up, skied off, and he was left buried face down in the snow with four broken ribs? 7386, very good question. And I gather those weren't his only injuries. But you know, we need to understand he had a witness called Craig Ramon. She had several witnesses. Her husband, her son Moses, who evidently is going to be testifying. She had a four ski instructors there. Do you remember the old adage, there is safety in numbers? Do you also remember the other adage, might is right, and her pleadings include the fact that he's taking advantage of her because she's rich and famous. No mention as to the fact that in Utah, where the accident took place, that the person in front has the right of way. It's like a ski slope is like a highway. And I use the word highway in the classical meaning of a road, not Highway 901 or the M1. I use it as its classical meaning. The person in the front has right of way, obviously. The person in the back has eyes in the front of their head. They're supposed to be looking and seeing what's happening. I think it's really unfortunate that I'm called upon to comment because when I wrote my autobiography, which was published in 1997, and there was the possibility of it being filmed as a movie, Gwyneth Paltrow was the actress who was mooted to play me. Now, admittedly, that's nearly 30 years ago, but we have aged apace. And I'm not so sure that she could play me anymore. Well, she could play the older me, but she certainly couldn't play the younger me now. And I am very hesitant to comment upon a case that is ongoing because really one should only comment once, once all of the evidence is in. But it seems on the face of it very cut and dried. He was found face down by his friend who witnessed her slamming into him. He had four broken ribs and several other injuries and was passed out. Well, I'll tell you, if she loses, and on the face of it, she should lose, although, of course, who knows in a court of law where somebody is famous and somebody isn't? In, because in Europe, that would go against you. And I include a Britain in Europe now. But I gather in the United States of America, 
celebrity often does swing things in favor of the guilty. And on the face of it, I really don't see going off his injuries and her lack of injuries that her story makes sense that he slammed into her. And I would sincerely hope if she testifies to that effect and her witnesses testify to that effect and the court finds against them that they be charged with perjury. I don't know about you, but I am getting mightily sick and tired of people who abuse the court system and just lie so that they can have a legal advantage. And when their lies are found out, they are let off scot-free, maybe fined in terms of the court award against them for what effectively is the wrong they did but no form of recompense consequence or judgment against them for just abusing the court system and i'm getting mightily fed up of people who think they can abuse the court system because they are rich and or famous and not only do they do it but the courts allow them to do it because the justice system is set up in such a way that it's not really about justice. It's not really about law and order. It is about the enrichment of the members of the legal profession who perpetuate a system that is called the justice system, but often is rank in justice. So I don't think I can make my position any clearer than I've just done. So if it turns out I'm wrong and that Gwyneth Paltrow is speaking the truth, and I really don't see how she can be, because her lack of injuries and his possession of injuries are consistent with the fact that he's speaking the truth and she's going to try to make much of the fact that he texted somebody saying he's famous well that's a perfectly natural thing to do in the circumstances and she seems to think that her fame should work in her favor and to his detriment but if he comments on the fact that he's now caught up in a situation with somebody who's famous, somehow that means he's guilty and she's innocent? I don't think so. But let's watch the space and see what happens. And Angela Jones has been very droll and I could not resist quoting what she says. To misquote from a perfect murder, he, he is in love, she is in business. Angela Jones, I have no idea to whom you're referring. Aurora, Mickey, come and help Motti out here. Motti has no idea to whom Angela Jones is referring. He's in love and she's in business. Oh, I've got it now. H&M, the great love story. Never were truer words said. And I'll tell you, going off my experience and observation with my mother and women of that ilk, It's all transactionalism. It's all business, to put it another way. It's all about, now what can I get out of you? What do you have to give me? And 
well, I'll give what I have to give in exchange and find ways of giving ever increasing minimal amounts while exploiting ever increasing maximum amounts. And oh, isn't it just great that this schlumps in love with me? What a doubt! I remember when I was three years old picking up the fact that my mother had absolute contempt for my father. Three years old. I remember the incident as if it were yesterday. But I won't go into it. But I make the point for what it's worth. Liz Perez says, Lady C, please look into the Heritage Foundation request for Harry's visa application. In a nutshell, to spare you a long legal explanation here, Republican presidential candidates often take their cue from the Heritage Foundation. Therefore, it seems that when a Republican president is next elected, they will revoke Harry's visa, irrespective of which visa category he has obtained. I could go into all the possible character, character, ca ca categories, sorry, <laughs> and how they are all imperiled, but that this is not the forum. Liz Perez, you have brought to my attention what several other people have brought to my attention. Yes, the Heritage Foundation, which is a think tank, is waging a battle with the Washington DC officials who are refusing to provide any information, including texts and emails, with regard to Harry's visa application. Because Harry's visa application, which he would have had to make some sort of visa application, one of the requirements for getting a visa is answering the question have you ever taken any illegal substances? And if you answer yes, the likelihood is you will not be granted a visa. If you answer no, and it emerges that you have, you can be charged with perjury. It is a criminal offence to lie upon a visa application form. Now, did Harry declare his drug use? Very unlikely. The penalties for a breach of the immigration rules includes deportation, being barred from re-entering the country, being barred for applying from citizenship. One of the former federal prosecutors, his name is Nima Ramani, said, an admission of drug use is usually grounds for inadmissibility. This means Prince Harry's visa should have been denied or revoked because he admitted to using cocaine, mushrooms, and other drugs. According to Mr. Romani, who is the president of the West Coast Trial Lawyers based in Los Angeles, there are no exceptions for royalty or recre recreational use. Of course, the authorities will stonewall because Harry and Meghan are avowed supporters of the present United States administration. And let us not pretend that might isn't right and money doesn't talk and walk and that influence 
doesn't shove aside inconvenient laws in favor of the wrongdoers. Because that is precisely what happens, irrespective of which political party is in power. If you have any great confidence that when a Republican president gets in, that he will revoke Harry's visa, I would actually caution you against possible naivety because the Republican administration would also want to play ball with the British government and with the British Crown. And it is, if not likely, very possible that no United States president would want to deny entry to a member of the British royal family, irrespective of how flagrant the wrongdoing was. They'll just ignore it. I will be the most surprised person on earth if Harry suffers one consequence legally from the American authorities for the admission he has made, or the admissions, I should say, that he has made. If they caught him shooting up at the White House and had it on tape, they still wouldn't do anything. That's my cynical take on the matter. Could I be wrong? Well, we can always be optimists. Is it likely that I'm going to be wrong? I think we could always be realists. And on that note, I will say what Samsung Phone says. All of this repulsive behavior from H&M boils down to the fact that they were not given the half-in, half-out scenario that they wanted. And because of that, the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip had to endure H&M's gross disrespect. Now, two more elderly people, King Charles and Queen Camilla, are being targeted. It's disgraceful. Neither H nor M appears to have emotionally developed beyond the teenage years. If you take the royal family element out of the equation, these two would still be people that you would want to distance yourself from and keep out of your life. Their behavior is deplorable, deplorable behavior from these two. Samsung phone, I couldn't agree more. All of what we are seeing, the bitterness, the nastiness, the viciousness, is because they were thwarted. And since they couldn't plug in to the royal grid and suck every legal, electrical, financial, and worldly advantage out of the grid. They decided, you're my enemy. I'm going to trash you. It's going to work for me. And yes, it got them contracts. But has it worked? No, because it's got them on popularity. Every time those two open up their mouths, they lose more and more supporters. Do they have supporters? Yes. But are they growing their fan base? Well, to me, shrinkage is the absolute opposite of growth. And Harry has gone 
from being the most popular male member of the royal family to the most honor popular member of the royal family, along with Meghan. Some accomplishment, no? Teen the teen teen says, as you so often say, dear Lady C, you were spitting bricks in this video, but you made the point very clear, very clear. Yes, most women want a man, a real masculine man. I mean, who builds our cities? Who do you call when your plumbing doesn't work? Who do you call when your roof needs cleaning? Flooring? Remodeling? Men are needed for the world. They are absolutely necessary. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think each sex and everybody within the range has a place in this world. You know, if you look at it realistically, until the 20th century, men had an infinitely tougher time of it than women. Men had to fight in the wars, and be killed or maimed. Men had to go down in the mines and mine. But I sh I'm jumping the gun. I'm jumping the gun. In the agricultural day and age, men were the primary agriculturalists. The women, yes, they did help out but they did not do the manual labor to the extent that the men did. They took care of home, half, kiss and kin, and did far lighter work than men. Before that, before civilization, men were the hunter-gatherers women took care of the home in quotes really the cave and the hut now which was more difficult which was harder which was more dangerous i don't think we even need to answer that question fast forward to the industrial age while women stayed above ground and took care of the home and children and cooked and washed, and I'm not minimizing what they did, men were down in the mines. Man has always traditionally until the 20th century had a harsher physical life than women, partly because nature equipped them to be the stronger sex, obviously. Come feminism and come the First and Second World Wars and the post-industrial age, where women are now in the marketplace working. Still, most of the burdensome, arduous jobs are done by men. Now, I am not saying that a woman who does the same job as a man shouldn't get the same reward. But should a man who does a lesser job than a woman get a greater reward? Or should the woman get the greater reward? I would say the woman should get the greater reward. Whoever does the more arduous job 
or the more necessary job should be rewarded commensurately. That's called a fair play. Now we get on to the concept since feminism that men are somehow toxic and that masculinity is toxic. Masculinity is no more toxic than femininity. Each of them, in my opinion, and I'm not alone in thinking this, has a healthy and an unhealthy manifestation. You don't hear about toxic femininity nowadays, but you hear an awful lot about toxic masculinity. I don't want to get too deeply into this debate because I think that men are being hampered as the mother of two sons knowing the extent to which men are hampered nowadays by the zeitgeist of the age, by the anti-masculinity of the age. I have to say I am horrified that women who in some ways are a far more potent sex than men, because they may not be more potent physically, but they are often more potent in terms of character and tolerance, even of pain. And I have to tell you, I would sooner be up against a tough man than a tough woman, because it's been a my experience, and I'm now speaking as a woman of the world who has functioned very successfully in the world under various career guises. Nasty women are infinitely nastier than nasty men. Every single woman I know, and I know some of the most successful women, not only in this country, but in the world. And we all agree that when you're up against a nasty woman, she's infinitely worse than a nasty man. So where is this toxic masculinity that we keep on hearing about? Yeah, you know, men and masculinity, well, the roles of men and women have changed. So it's not even fruitful to go into the fact that until 1857, women and the introduction of the Married Women's Property Act, men had control of women's money, which was terrible for women. Terrible. But that's 1857. This is nearly 170 years later. The world has moved on considerably. I think it's time that women embraced masculinity as a desirable for men and femininity as a desirable for women. Because, you know, what you find in toxic relationships is often the inversion and the perversion of the masculine and feminine roles. Look at Harry and Meghan. She is clearly the dominant partner in that union. She is effectively the man in that relationship. Look at her body language. For all of her frou-frou feminism, she stands up like a man. Look at it. She oozes power. 
and in a very masculine, unattractive way for a woman. Women can ooze power without oozing masculinity. Then look at Harry. His body language is that of, well, it's extremely effete. It's very unmasculine. It's almost offensively effete. I hope that addresses the question. Uh, because I certainly have been very fortunate in my life to have a series of fantastic men. And because of my upbringing, once it got widespread publicity, men who were not sure of their masculinity, thank God, avoided me like the plague. That's right. They avoided me like the plague. Because they didn't want the nature of my upbringing reflecting adversely upon their masculinity. Well, real men weren't bothered because they knew it wasn't going to reflect upon their masculinity adversely or in any other way at all. So it rarely separated the wheat from the chaff, which was wonderful. And I have had a series of marvelous men in my life who were real men. And I'll tell you something, real men aren't cruel. Real men are kind and gentle. Yes, they're masculine, delightfully so. They're not Mampalos. They're not effete. They are men. Now, if a woman has lesbianic tendencies and doesn't really want to come out of the closet and therefore wants to have a man that's effectively a woman, I'm not going to knock her for that. You know, different strokes for different folks. But it's been my experience that what you used to see was a real woman wanted a real man. And that goes to character. That goes to personality. That goes to what masculinity and femininity are truly about because they are not incompatible they are truly compatible and it is wonderfully reassuring to be in a relationship with somebody who is truly what he or she should be as opposed to somebody who's hedging their bets and having all sorts of issues where issues should not arise at all. I make those points for what they're worth. Donna Bardston says, now that's one area I agree with Lady C on. Harry's lack of masculinity, I vain. In interviews, his hands are flopping and waving around. His tone of voice is wimpy. When walking, uh, yes, he does, doesn't he? Oh, I, and uh, I hear around, you know, and despite having a deep voice, he does so, 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 he's so mamby pamby like a red little wuss. <laughs> I'm a delicate little flower. When walking, his legs are like marionette legs. 
perfectly spotted. Just watch and you'll see it. It's also a sign of immaturity. Even his skin is pasty and white. Well, maybe he could go into the sun a bit more. Add to that constant whining his poor me victimhood and he is a total turn off. Like a baby, no mature real woman would be attracted to that in a man. And I couldn't agree more. No woman who is truly mature, who is truly in touch with her femininity, and who is going to use her femininity to enhance her life and the life of those around her, as opposed to exploit it for worldly gain and power plays and actual advantage, the way my mother did and the way Meghan Markle does. No woman who is a real woman, a mature woman, is attracted to a Mampalu. And once she discovers that he's a Mampalu, does she have respect for him? No, but I'll tell you what I observed with my parents, because my father was a very masculine man. And he started out as, because he loved his mother, he started out as a woman-loving male who was actually very masculine. And my mother was, as my brother, brother used to say, a ball-breaking bitch. And she set out to wear him down so that she would be in the ascendant position. And it took years, but she succeeded. Everybody has weaknesses. I don't think my father married to a different woman would have become the pathetic, characterless, pussy whipped jerk that he ended up being where all of us were concerned i don't think he would have but she wore him down he could have left and he didn't leave maybe he couldn't leave maybe he was weaker than she was well he was weaker than she was because he at least had some heart, she had none. The problem with when you are up against a heartless individual is you are inevitably going to lose because if you have a heart, they will find ways and means of manipulating you to your own detriment and your own destruction. And you rarely have to get out or end up being destroyed. We can see Harry's ever-increasing destruction because he may have started out as being a pathetic little mama's boy, but he didn't start out as being the creepy Mampalo that he has shown us he is. Remember? I'm going to write about not the prince I was born, but the man I am, the man I have become. Well, he's become a mouse, and not even a mouse that roars, a mouse that whimpers. <laughs> pathetic, pathetic. But that's what happens when you are involved in a very destructive relationship, especially where your manipulator is releasing all the destructive elements within your personality to your detriment and, and their ultimate advantage. In my opinion, relationships like that are really sick. When I realized I was involved in one, 
I got out. I had sufficient self-respect to know it was going to be him or me. It was going to be me. I got out. That's what people need to do. Get out. They need to stop dressing up destructiveness as love, as whatever they wish to call it. It's not love. It's a form of hatred. Robin Smith says, oh, and may I say, and no matter how much you love somebody who is hateful and is going to destroy you, they're going to destroy you. Because you're playing love, they're playing hate. Hate will always consume love in a personal relationship. That's been my experience. Of course, it sometimes takes a very long time to get to that realization. And it's a very painful road to travel. That's why we need to have compassion for King Charles III and Harry's family. Because disturbing as it is for us as onlookers, just imagine how much worse it is for them. Because we don't really love Harry. They do. Robin Smith says, I've always been quite confused as to who wears the pants or the dress in Ginger and Meg's house. Now they're so sorting out all the gender issues in others around the world. They may be able to clear their confusions up. No, what they're doing is acting out on an international scale and claiming yet again to possess knowledge when they are only ignorant. There is no doubt, according to everybody who knows Harry and Meghan well, that Harry and Meghan are a couple where she is the dominatrix and he is the subservient. Yes, she gives him his moment every now and then, but it doesn't alter the fact she is giving him his moment. She is allowing him to feel, oh, I'm the big man, strong man now. I'm going to protect Meg. Oh, I'm going to protect Meg. Meg needs protection. Oh, yes. Poor, sweet little Meg. Meg who cries and breaks down when she's not being a big, strong, dominating woman. She's being a sweet and delicate little flower. They have no contribution to make on the gender issue, save in terms of being representatives of a toxic couple, the embodiment of a toxic couple, destructive, damaging to their own interests and those of everybody whose path they cross. Are they going to sort out anybody's gender issues? Well, only if they're aiming for neuter gender to become two its, two inanimate objects, not only neutral in terms of gender, but neuter in terms of being. To its. If you want to add an SH in front of that, you're welcome to do so. Kate McCool says, Yes, Meg and Harry are elitist of the highest order. They never ever talk about income inequality, ever. 
and they never will. Well spotted, Kate McCool. What I have tried to show is that Meghan and Harry, really Meghan, because Harry is just an idiot, and Harry is an educationally subnormal idiot who basically doesn't know what he's talking about, but mouths the, the latest claptrap that comes out of whatever orifice she's speaking out of at the moment. You notice none of it ever involves the betterment of people financially. None of it. They don't come up with economic policies or fit into economic slots which would be bettering humanity generally. Everything is a plug in to benefiting themselves and elitist organizations and money making enterprises. None of whom I have to say have so far struck me as being productive, there is something very parasitic about all of the enterprises and endeavors that Harry and Meghan are affiliated with. Better Up, for instance, is basically a parasitic organization playing upon the foibles of people in the workplace to promise them or uh, improvement in their lives for a fee. Illusion, snake oil merchants, more than likely. Maybe they're not gonna do much harm, but how much good are they gonna do? I think very little. That's just one. Spotify? Entertainment, parasitic entertainment, destructive entertainment, damaging entertainment, not plugging into anything productive or life enhancing, discussing and detailing everything negative. Netflix, one vicious, destructive lie after another. Now, the Commonwealth of Nations is nothing but Empire 2.0. It's all of those horrid, nasty white people trying to destroy black people, stealing their natural assets so that rich white people will continue to be rich while poor black people suffer spoken for by a brown woman with absolutely no merit or truth whatsoever. Race baiting of the highest order. Can you think of one thing that Harry and Meghan have done since they were independent that wasn't self-interested and ultimately destructive, even going to that school in Harlem, taking two boxes of dugu dugu rotten fruit and vegetables, plugging her stench, oh sorry, her wench, sorry, her wrench, oh, what was the name of it again? I think she called it the bench, bench, bench which again was pure, absolute clap, trap and rubbish. Self-glorifying nonsense that, if you stop to think of it, was wildly inappropriate for the target audience. And do you remember the interactions with some of the children? Quite shocking. They're not interested in bettering humanity. They're interested in exploiting 
the foibles, the weaknesses, the inequalities, and the vulnerabilities of humanity, so that they will make money for themselves and gain reputations as great humanitarians. Had they been humanitarians, they would have stayed within the royal family and behaved the way the other royals do and genuinely contributed to humanity. They are frauds and phonies. Their actions are eloquent as to the fact that they are not what they pretend to be. They are elitists of the highest order. They only mix with the elite. They travel in a way that most elitists don't do. I know some of the richest people on this planet and I know many who are very well off, just not that rich. And I can tell you, most truly grand people do not live the lifestyles of Harry and Meghan and their ilk. They live more productive and constructive and low-key lifestyles. If they care about the planet, they fly commercial. They don't take private jets everywhere. Harry and Meghan are not only two of the greatest elitists that it has ever been our displeasure to observe in action, but they are rank hypocrites with it. Sheila White says, very true about the left-right aspects of fascism. She works for big capitalism, the biggest. Hitler left the economy to be run by German banks and industries, but Labour had no independent unions. She and Harry are not woke heroes. They use the woke dialect to attract general support. But, is it, but it is a veil for not changing where power resides in the past. We live in a time when this has never been as flagrant as this Hitler and Mussolini has low-key but formal agreements with their respective business interests. You may be one of the very few channels on YouTube that knows this. Thank goodness. I... I'm afraid uh, maybe I misread it slightly. If I didn't, uh, there is a typographical error or two which maybe slightly confuses the point. But uh, I think, though, you make a very valid point, and it's a point I've been trying to make. You know, the Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Lenins, the, the Stalins, they were all about loving the people and improving the lot of the people and improving humanity as they did the absolute opposite. I don't buy Harry and Meghan's woke rhetoric for one nanosecond. They were royal. They had all the privileges and possibilities and chances of royalty. They didn't need to move out except to make money. But of course, had they moved out and come up with right-wing rhetoric, they wouldn't have been making any money. So they came up with woke left-wing rhetoric. Meghan was talking 
the talk, the higher up she moved in the social scale was the more enlightened, in quotes, and humanitarian, in quotes, she became. So what does she do? She flies to India and she pays women a nominal sum to pretend that she is enhancing their lives. She goes to Africa. She takes her stylist, her hairdresser, her makeup artist, uh, everything but the kitchen sink. And since she didn't have a tiara, she didn't take it. Otherwise, I'm sure she would have. And poses with poor women. This is not being humanitarian. This is using woke rhetoric in the most cynical way to present yourself as a humanitarian when you are nothing but a crass opportunist. I think we need to drop the left and right wing labels and just call people out for what they really are because they are hiding between, uh, sorry, they're hiding behind labels that give them protection from exposure. They need to be exposed for what they are. Crass, authoritarian, elitists who are intent on gathering as much power into their own hands as possible and as being rewarded financially as much as possible while depriving everybody else of their right to approximate equality with leaders. Because remember, Meghan and Harry have proposed themselves as leaders. Who elected them as leaders? Royals are not leaders. Royals are servants. They're not leaders. They're servants. How come all of a sudden Meghan and Harry are leaders? And leadership is a word that she uses and has been using quite a lot, even before she met up with Harry. The woman's ambitions are flagrant and frightening. And if you're not aware of it, you should be. And I will reiterate, we should be dropping the labels left wing or right wing because people who are leftist will think, oh, well, yeah, she's fine. She's leftist. Well, she's not fine because she's not leftist. Yvonne Walker says, Dear Lady C, is it true that when Prince Edward dies, his title will not pass to his son, but instead will be returned to the crown? If so, will this be the case for all those holding the rank of Duke? No, it's only Prince Edward's. Prince Edward has the equivalent of a latter-day pre- revolutionary French brevet dukedom. They were customarily granted for the life of a war hero. So it's really the equivalent of a life peerage. It's a life dukedom. I mean, brevet dukedoms were life dukedoms usually. All other dukes in this country are hereditary dukes. He's unique. He is the only duke that is not going to pass his dukedom on to his son.
it has been a very resourceful and elegant solution to the promise that the king, the late queen, and the late Duke of Edinburgh gave to Prince Edward on his wedding day. And I have observed before, and I'm going to repeat it again, that it was a delicate matter that was going to be handled to the satisfaction of all. And I'm the only person who pointed out that the likelihood was that he would be, I don't even think I used the word likelihood. I think I said that it, the, he would ultimately be given a, the latter-day equivalent of a brevi dukedom, but that it would be in keeping with his agreements with his mother, father and brother with regard to his children. And sure enough, it's happened. And I'm not a fortune teller. I don't have a crystal ball. So if I was able to say it, I was able to say it because this was in the pipeline as a possibility. And it has materialized. But no, Edward is the only duke in this country who will not pass down his dukedom to his son and heir. Michael Willoughby says, Hi Lady C, what are your thoughts on the removal of Titles Bill up for its second reading on Friday? I have some close connections in the field and they are saying Rachel Maskell is gradually getting more and more support as every day goes by. I hear the support is growing due to the perceived constant intent on damaging the reputation of the kingdom by any means by Pinocar Harker, <laughs> that's a new one, and her overweening lapdog. Well, I am very uncomfortable, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again, with any change to the law that allows Parliament to initiate the deprivation of a peerage, save as an attainder. But I am all in favour of the law passing, giving the king the right to strip a holder of a peerage of the peerage. Parliament should not have certain rights. If you read history and you understand how we came to have a civil war in this country, you will understand that Parliament is a two-edged sword and you cannot give politicians too much power because if you do they will misuse it and Parliament should not have the right to deprive of any deprive any body of a peerage or a title of any description just because that person is unpopular. There are few grounds upon which a peerage can be taken away, usually treason. Some people would say, oh, well, if the king won't do it, Parliament should do it. The fount of honours is the monarch. What emanates from him 
should also devastate from him. And not from political opportunists. I'm not so naive as to think that most politicians have anything except their own backsides and interests at heart. Sorry, not all, but most. We only need to look at what has come out recently about COVID and the way COVID was manipulated, not only in the United Kingdom, but in the United States, to the detriment of the populace and the economies of both countries for the enrichment and political enhancement of a few. Chief of which in this country is a deplorable creature called Matt Hancock, who in my opinion has so much guilt on his back, all because he wanted to fight a good fight that would enhance his career and didn't mind destroying the economy of this country and the lives of many people and the health of many people in this country. Oh, and he, I fear, is only too representative of a very unfortunate tendency in the world nowadays. There was a time when politicians entered politics because they regarded it as their public duty for the good of the country. Now it's for their own personal good. We need to be very careful how much power we give to anything that is called a politician. And on that note, I will say thank you very much for listening. I hope this has been of some interest to you. If it has, please keep the questions and comments coming in because this cannot be done without you. Absolutely can't. Thank you so much. God bless. Goodbye. And if you have enjoyed this, please like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell, and see you next time. God bless. Bye.